uh, on behalf of the Digital Media and Learning Research Initiative and the Digital Media and Learning Research Hub, of which I'm the director, uh, my name is David Theo Goldberg. It's uh, an enormous pleasure to welcome you all uh, to uh, this annual conference of the Digital Media, the third annual conference of the Digital Media and Learning um, Initiative. Uh, I want to begin uh, just by uh, first welcoming you and making you feel at home. Uh, it's going to be an intensive three days. Uh, we hope uh, enormously uh, awarding and rewarding. Uh, we have a number of announcements to make uh, over the period of these three days. Uh, so there's lots of new work uh, about to come out. Uh, but I'm going to be fairly brief. Uh, just uh, to be able to thank our sponsors without whom this would not be possible and would not have been possible. Um, the first is to thank uh, our principal sponsor, which is the MacArthur Foundation and the Digital Media and, uh, Learning Initiative at the MacArthur Foundation. I think I don't have to tell you that the Foundation has uh, been both the leader and inspiration in opening up the field of digital media and learning and expanding it and supporting it uh, in ways, you know, not five years ago would have been unimaginable. Uh, when one thinks of a room full of people like this, uh, you know, on a cold rainy day in San Francisco, uh, we, we couldn't have imagined this starting out, you know, uh, uh, roughly five years ago. So uh, it's, uh, we're enormously grateful uh, to the courage that they've shown uh, and the leadership they've shown uh, in bringing us to this point. Uh, I particularly want to thank uh, Julie, Julia Stash, the uh, Vice President uh, for Domestic Programs uh, at the Foundation uh, for uh, so strongly supporting the initiative uh, and our undertakings in all of this. Uh, I also want to thank the Gates Foundation, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, both Karina Wong and Robert Torres uh, uh, for their support in particular of the conference itself. Uh, they uh, have given us support to make this possible uh, and it has made our lives a whole lot easier so uh, I want to thank them enormously as well and they're, they're engaged in conversation with us. Uh, in addition, uh, the Mozilla Foundation, Mark Sermon and his team have been an enormous support uh, both conceptually and in working with us very intensively, uh, both on the digital media and learning competition, we'll make the award announcements tonight as you know, uh, and uh, in just uh, uh, thinking through um, the future of undertakings in relation to digital media and learning. They've, they've been uh, enormously engaging with us. Uh, and then also Microsoft Research, Dana Boyd, uh, has supported the conference in a variety of ways and we want to thank uh, her. Uh, last but not least, uh, I want to thank the, uh, the team at the University of California Humanities Research Institute, which is really the host institution uh, for the Dig Digital Media and Learning uh, Research Hub uh, at uh, the University of California uh, Irvine. UCHRI is a UC-wide research institute, uh, and the staff there uh, have worked tirelessly round the clock for months and months and months on end. Uh, I won't mention names, but you'll meet many of them uh, throughout the day. You probably would have been in touch with uh, some of them just to be here. Uh, and so I think uh, please join me in giving them an enormous round of applause. Uh, this would not be possible without them. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of uh, the Digital Media and Learning Conference, uh, Diana Roten. Uh, Diana has been a partner and interlocutor uh, with various programs in the initiative pretty much since the outset. She, as she puts it, been engaged in education and learning pretty much throughout her life. Uh, she has a PhD from just down the road in Stanford. Um, so we want to welcome her back from New York to, to uh, where she really belongs. Right? Uh, she uh, was uh, really the instigator of an organization called Stardle, which was a, a, a 
an organization in New York City, but which was really national, if not international, in helping uh, startups in the field of digital media and learning. She was engaged in getting uh, the learning network uh, in New York City up and going. Uh, she's now working with Joel Klein, the former uh, Chancellor of Schools in the New York uh, public school system, uh, with whom she has worked and continues to work uh, closely. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Diana will welcome us uh, to the opening uh, and introduce our keynote speaker. Uh, please welcome Diana Roten. Thank you. you're at a tech conference when there's three computers, five personal devices, and two people. <laughs> so I'm truly, truly thrilled to be here. Um, I've been, as David mentioned, fortunate enough to be a member of the DML community for the last five years or so, and it's been an incredible experience and ride. Um, I remember when we were just a small group with big goals. We could have fit in one meeting room in a Holiday Inn in Mattoon, Illinois. Anyone here from Mattoon? Now look at us. We number close to 1,000. We hail from North America, including Canada and Mexico, and of course, Mattoon. Uh, South America, Brazil. Europe, including England, Italy, the Netherlands. Asia, Bangladesh, India. We represent institutions of higher education, K through 12 schools, museums and libraries, community youth organizations, private companies and entrepreneurial startups, governmental agencies and offices, including the US Army, and even the Federal Reserve, as well as Lady Gaga. Now you tell me another community that has that diversity. So we are now officially a big movement with audacious goals here at the Wyndham in San Francisco. So to MacArthur Foundation, to the DML Hub, to all of you, congratulations. You have arrived, and the time is now. So why are we all here? What are these audacious goals? And what is this historical moment all about? Well, it was in Silicon Valley, just about half a, half, a century, half a century ago, that microcomputers, among many other key technologies, were first developed. It was with the emergence of these microcomputers and other technologies that for the first time in US history, people began to contemplate seriously the potential of computer technologies for education. In the last 40 years, the exponentially increasing powers and dramatically decreasing costs of computer technologies have surpassed even our wildest dreams of those early days. Yet, there is still very little evidence of any major successful tech-enabled innovation or disruption altering the structure and school of mainstream education, in my humble opinion. That change has been constrained less by the lack of technological innovation than it has been by the limits of our sociological imagination. So what do I mean by that? In the last decades of the 20th century, the kinds of education, tech, education technology products and promises, let's say school information management systems, courseware programs, managed learning environments, all of these that came out of the Silicon Valley as well as other centers of innovation, tended to focus primarily on increasing the efficiency of schooling as we know it, rather than reimagining and improving the efficacy of learning as it could be. Now, the first instinct when new technologies are introduced into any field is to automate and accelerate existing activities. So the same has just simply been true in education. Thus, in the past, enticing looking technologies have led many innovators and entrepreneurs to build tools for schools, back rooms, and classrooms without thinking about how they could or should change teaching and learning, just simply trying to make them faster and easier. More recently, in the first decade of the 21st century, a wave of newer digital learning products have emerged on the scene, promising new game-based, mobile-enabled, geolocative, platform-driven teaching and learning experiences. Compared to many of their predecessors from decades ago, this new cohort of entrepreneurs and innovators have focused largely on products seeking to serve the learner and outside of the school. As someone who has helped to create the conditions that drive this kind of outside-in grassroots innovation, I have to say, 
that I believe that for education innovation to ultimately benefit the majority of kids in this world, which is why I hope we are all here, it must eventually travel to the center of kids' lives. And today, for the good or the bad, wherever you stand, schools continue to occupy the center of many child's, children's lives, certainly here in the US. Given that, as long as we constrain ourselves to thinking about this notion of schooling, this gets to my sociological imagination point, as something that can only happen between 28 students and one teacher within 1,500 square feet and from the hours of 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., then I don't care what an entrepreneur and innovator from Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, or Silicon Roundabout develops. We will never fundamentally change the future of teaching and learning. And those entrepreneurs will have a hard time getting the opportunity, and most will die trying. Thus, in a world where the lower cost and greater ubiquity of digital media and de personal devices, the opportunity to create new models of anywhere, anytime learning, including but not limited to schools, is greater than ever, as is the responsibility. When 30% of our high school students here in the US drop out, and as high as 50% in the city in which I live, and 93% of them are online, and 78% of them have cell phones, and a steadily increasing 40% have smartphones. We need to reach these kids where they are, when they need it, and with whatever tools, this, this moment is more important than ever. So, while there are fundamental differences between the older school-centered education technology and new, newer learner-centered digital perspect learning perspectives, these communities need not be in conflict, as they have been in the past. <clears throat> in fact, I believe they are complements to one another. And they are critical and necessary synergies of one another. And I believe that the time for that ground shift is right now, right here, with the convergence of different communities and perspectives coming together in this room. Building a new future for teaching and learning in a connected world not only allows but requires bridging in-school and out-of-school learning practices and philosophies through networks of institutions and opportunities. In a world where DC-7s have given way to Dreamliners, telegrams to smartphones, don't we owe it to our kids that schooling should give way to learning? So, I am now going to pass the mantle to John Silly Brown. But before, please let me introduce him. John Silly Brown, AKA JSB, is a visiting scholar and advisor to the provost at the University of Southern California and the independent co-chairman of Deloitte Center for the Edge. Prior to that, he was the chief scientist of Xerox, Xerox Corporation and the director of its Palo Alto Research Center, otherwise known as PARC, right here in Silicon Valley. He held this position for near, nearly two decades, and while head of PARC, he expanded the role of corporate research to include topics such as radical innovation, organizational learning, complex adaptive systems, and nanotechnologies. I'd say most of those are relevant to the future of teaching and learning, and maybe nanotechnologies will be part of your talk, too. <laughs> it's too late. That wave is over. His personal research interests include digital youth culture, digital media, and institutional innovation. I have had the pleasure of knowing JSB for the last 15 years. We met when I was about 12 years old. <laughs> Since that time, he has been an incredible friend, an amazing colleague, and an incredibly necessary mentor. Today, he's going to talk to us about a world where we imagine the constraints of classrooms and chalkboards giving way to the expansiveness of networks and web searches, a world where entrepreneurial learners find not only the resources, but the peers and experiences to learn, make, play, anywhere, anytime. And with that, on to you. Actually, Diana, let's just take questions. Get up here. <laughs> Your introduction, I mean, about the whole DML movement was, uh, was inspiring. I think really did nail uh, the issues that we have to think about. Um, I became interested in this more around the notion of rethinking what does it mean to be an entrepreneurial learner. This does not mean how to become an entrepreneur. This really means how do you constantly look around you all the time for new ways, new resources to learn new things. That's the sense of entrepreneur I'm talking about that now in the network age almost gives us unlimited possibility. But as Diana said, 
Just being able to learn as individuals is not enough. The real question is, how do we start to scale these types of learning systems that we all come here to talk about? Because I think scalability is a critical issue. So I want to give you first a preamble, and then we'll kind of move into the, the core of this topic. Um, we're all used to seeing charts like this, the whole notion that our digital infrastructure, what you might characterize as the 21st century infrastructure, is really radically different than anything civilization has ever seen before. In the past, basically, we always had these S-curves. We had brief moments of radical disruption and then 40, 50, 60 years of stability in which we actually invented the institutional practices, the institutional forms, the work practices, the social practices that knew how to grow up and use those relatively stable infrastructures. Electrification has not changed in IOTA in the last 100 years, um, as just one example. But as you all know today, uh, in the digital infrastructure, we're now engaged in a world in which every year we're having doubling um, and these exponential curves are wonderful and also driving us crazy. Um, they're driving us crazy in a good way because in fact it's not the technology that matters as Diana carefully pointed out. It's really how do we take these technologies and invent new types of institutional forms, new types of social practices, um, and in fact, new types of skills to be able to leverage the capabilities of the technology. The technology is the easy part. The hard part is what are the social practices around this and also the institutional structures. Um, we've got to ask ourselves, what were the institutions of schooling, universities, research universities actually look like five or 10 years from now. And if they look the same as they do now, we got problems. <laughs> um, so I want to just kind of characterize these changes. I've just come from actually talking to the presidents of many of the research universities in a meeting three days ago on this, um, that in fact, one of the keys of these exponential changes is you can now expect the half-life of a skill, most skills we pick up, to have about five years. It used to be not too long ago uh, when Diana was just a child <laughs> that, that, uh, that you could count or pick up a set of skills and basically hold those for life. Uh, today, that no longer works. You're constantly reinventing, augmenting those skills. Um, and in fact, I think it's fair to say uh, that you really have now moving from a 20th century notion um, of looking at how do you pick up a set of fixed assets um, that are authoritative, transfer to you in delivery models often called schooling, um, that have wonderful scalable efficiency because we can talk to 100 people or 100,000 people basically simultaneously. How do we move from that transfer model to the model of how do you participate on the ever moving flows of activities, knowledge, and so on and so forth? How do you move from being like a steamship that sets course and keeps going for a long time to what you might call whitewater kayaking, that you have to be in the flow and you have to be able to pick things up on the moment. You gotta feel it with your body. You gotta be a part of that. Uh, you gotta be in it, not just above it and learning about it. Um, we wanna argue that in this new world of flows, participating in these knowledge flows is an active sport. Um, and the whole catch is how do you participate in these flows, um, and how do you actually, in these flows of constant change, is no longer learning the old that matters so much, is how do you constantly create the new? And here's the catch. In a world of constant change, constant flux, learning has as much to do with creating the new as learning the old, but in creating the new, much of what is created is basically tacit. It has not had enough time to be crystallized out as explicit knowledge. So the role of tacit knowledge, or picking up the tacit, is becoming increasingly important, and virtually none of our theories of transfer of learning or of schooling really direct the notion of how you cope with the tacit knowledge um, that kind of flows hidden beneath us all the time. Um, and so I think we're gonna see, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, that the tacit is becoming increasingly important but as Diana suggested, we are at an amazing moment. I like to think of it as a Cambrian moment. I think of it very much like actually, well, you weren't yet born. 
Uh, well, I first went to, to Xerox Park actually in the early 70s, uh, mid 70s. That uh, you made it, no, you weren't. <laughs> uh, that basically everything was up for grabs. It was a new world. We could basically build anything we wanted and we could try anything we wanted. Well, basically, in this Cambrian moment now, in this age of the network, um, really I have a feeling, again, it's kind of like that Cambrian moment. Everything is up for grabs. We are here to shape that future. Uh, I think that is our real goal. Um, I'm really struck by a couple of quotes that have always driven me. Uh, one by Tim, the world just came together so quickly in this network age. We have little understanding of its true diversity. Yet in these periods of radical change, which are always going to now be with us, understanding how to leverage diversity is going to be increasingly important. And my buddy John Rendon in Washington, the past as a solution set is simply no longer a viable option. We need to create a new tool set. And by new tool set, he means institutions as much as the classical sense of tools. Um, nevertheless, we'd be foolish to say we can that we can't learn from the past. In fact, oh, learning from the past, let me give you guys a quiz. <laughs> Sorry, Mimi. <laughs> um, what do these guys have in common besides being what you might call a bit creative and a bit out of the box thinkers, doers, and tinkerers? Now, you probably recognize most of these kids. Uh, Jeff Bezos, Will Wright, uh, what I call the Google kids down the street, uh, Jimmy Wales. Um, now, the obvious answer is they have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> now, somehow I overlooked that fact, as a matter of fact, when I first put this collection together. There is another unifier for this entire collection of guys. Um, what is. Pardon me? Um, Yes, you might ask that. <laughs> and we might just come back to that. <laughs> uh, but here is the answer. Let's step back a moment. Look at the heroes, at least my heroes, back 75 years ago or so, that really drove a phenomenal movement in education. The Montessori, Maria Montessori, the first woman, uh, and John Dewey. Um, the answer to that quiz is every one of those folks in the earlier page went to Montessori schools. Now, there may be a lesson there about what's the importance of play, what's the importance of embodied learning, and so on and so forth. There are women, but they're not quite as famous as those guys in Silicon Valley. So I put their images up so you would get it. Uh, but nevertheless, here are our heroes, my heroes at least from the past. Um, but, but sadly, as Diana was suggesting in a slightly different way, their methods didn't scale. Perhaps they were 75 years ahead of their time. Perhaps their intuitions were right, but their tool set, going back to John Rendon, was wrong. Maybe, just maybe, they can now. And so it becomes interesting to say, how might we relook at scaling? Let's look at some examples and see even how many of the Montessori ideas, for example, could be recast in the network age that might provide us a way to create what I might call an arc of life learning um, that scales. So let's step back a moment. Here's an example when I came across it with um, uh, the father sitting in the audience here, uh, or actually, is it the grandfather? I'm not sure. <laughs> you can tell me later, Dick. Uh, uh, but here's a two year old looking over the shoulder uh, of his five year old sister, um, totally transfixed, looking at her surfing something on the web on her little iPhone. I don't think of the iPhone, and nor I think does she, um, as basically a communication device. I think of it as a device to amplify curiosity. It is a curiosity amplifier. And this curiosity amplifier is for a rapidly changing world. It turns out to be an amazingly important tool. 
and every one of us in this audience um, is so used to using the iPad or the iPhone or some equivalent device to constantly look up things. In fact, I have a hard time having a, con a phone conversation today uh, without having my iPad there, constantly looking up, well, what's that word mean? Or that's an idea I never heard of. Or what school did that person really go to? Did he really, really go to Montessori? It's a question I had. Uh, <laughs> the answer is kind of yes, but <laughs> the previous slides. Uh, I was going to put up uh, Bill Gage, but he actually was more of um, the associated movement of uh, Montessori. Um, but let's look at some more examples of scaling. I want to go through a bunch of very quick examples. Um, I'm very fond of thinking about the Harry Potter worldwide movement in terms of the fan fiction networks and fanfiction.com, et cetera. And the numbers there, and the audience, people in the audience know a hell of a lot more about this than I do. But it's very interesting to see that because of the networked age, now there are over 6,000 communities of interest that have been created around Harry Potter. Um, there are thousands of discussion forums. There are, in some ways, 386,000 stories that have now been written, but perhaps more surprising, surprising to me um, is there are the equivalent to at least, I would say, 100, maybe more, equivalent of 400 page novels have been written by kids joining this Harry Potter movement. Writing is back, writing is here in a major way, and we have the tools and the social networking to incite and to incent uh, people to do amazing pieces of work. Um, and I keep being blown away by people telling me, oh no, no, today's kids don't read, they don't write, and I just say, well, pardon me, let me take you to some of these fan sites and look at some of the stories, look at some of the books actually being uh, um, written. In fact, I think actually the, the most recent data is there are about a thousand, you probably know, a thousand books of more than 400 pages per book have now been written in this fan, uh, fanzine group. Um, the, um, let me go to something that I know um, because I grew up with this a little bit more about uh, is World of Warcraft. Um, and it's very interesting to me to notice that um, I didn't check last night, but uh, a couple of nights ago, there were over 14,000 new ideas created in one night on better ways to play some of the new high-end raids in World of Warcraft. Knowledge production and knowledge dissemination is happening at an unbelievable rate. Um, in fact, if you think about the social life around the edge of the game, I'm not arguing that the World of Warcraft as a game is all that important. I'm arguing that the social life around the edge of the game, the learning ecologies, the knowledge ecologies being created on the fly as emergent properties of playing this game better and better, created by the kids themselves, is something we ought to understand. The social dynamics of that is very, very important. And you look at these, um, the infrastructure being created to support the videos, the forums, um, the wikis, the blogs, and so on and so forth. And if you really think about it, um, this is a, a week ago, uh, uh, how does this work? I mean, how can 12,000, 14, 15,000 new ideas a night be processed? Well, again, you want to talk about institutional innovation? What have these kids invented? New institutional forms, in forms of the ways to structure guilds that turn out to be knowledge processors. And basically, a guild is going after high-end raids. You will basically have many sub-parts of that guild that will take on responsibilities for processing this chunk of knowledge, this chunk of knowledge, this chunk of knowledge. They get these ideas, they try them out that afternoon. The things that actually work, they pass up to the uh, a high end raid leader uh, sub guild and so on and so forth. And so what's really happened here is a social structure has emerged within each of these guilds um, that actually turns out to be an amazing knowledge refinery. Knowledge is being created on the fly, filtered on the fly, validated on the fly, and then passed into action every 24 hours, literally around the world. 
Well, what is the social dynamics underlying that form of learning, that form of knowledge creation? It's something I think we have an opportunity to study and better learn as we try to figure out, Diana, new ways to scale some of this. Um, and what I find so beautiful about the social life around uh, the edge of World of Warcraft is what you do in playing that game, because it's moderately complicated, like a lifelong pursuit to some, <laughs> That's another problem, <laughs> uh, is that these kids craft their own dashboards in order to measure their own performance and to amplify their ability to learn new skills more rapidly than anybody else. Now think about this. What would it mean in the workplace? What would it mean in the school system if assessment wasn't superimposed on top, but we gave kids toolkits to be able to monitor their own behaviors. They would get constant readouts for the sole purpose of helping them become higher performance. And you would find competition about who was building the most interesting toolkits. I found this toolkit particularly great for this. And in fact, you will find in this social life around the edge of some of these games like World of Warcraft, basically an amazing mashup community that are constantly mashing up new toolkits to measure themselves uh, so they can get better faster. And I keep thinking, what would the workplace be like if, in fact, instead of having managers superimpose measurements on us in the workforce, if we actually crafted our own measurements for us to figure out how much time am I spending in email? How much time am I wasting in, uh, in random phone calls and so on and forth? How do I actually start to have tools to reflect on how I'm spending my time uh, so I can be more effective and so on and so forth? These are what th these kids on the social life, on the edge of these games, have figured out how to do. We have a lot to learn from them. But let me look at another example in terms of the power of the social life amplified or made possible in part through the social networks of learning. Let's go to Ryerson College, a little school in Toronto, it's not that little, um, and look at what Chris did. Chris, having to learn organic chemistry, organized his own study group. Those of us that come out of some of the classical forms of education know that study groups are probably the most effective way to learn anything. Um, well, he organized a pretty big study group. He organized a group on Facebook of 146 members of his class. It was a wonderful study group. It was called, of course, coming a little bit from the old days, Dungeons Mastering Chemistry Solutions. It was a great idea. However, be aware, implementing new tool sets can be a bit problematic. Chris was thrown out of Ryerson College uh, for inventing using this new toolkit for learning. Uh, Many charges were brought against him. Um, and in fact, if you distill it all out, three fundamental cases were brought. The argument was, learning should be hard. <laughs> there is no structure or regulation for online behavior that makes it incompatible with academic work. Um, I kid you not, this comes from a law case. Uh, it is our job to protect academic integrity from any threat. And a nice caveat at the bottom of this legal case, unless learning is hard and is directed by others, it fails to meet the standard of academic rigor. So going back to Diana's point, one of our challenges is institutional innovation. Uh, now, thank heavens, uh, the faculty did step in after the rulings were passed, and then they knew seven-page ruling, the engineering faculty uh, uh, appeals committee found no proof, quote unquote, that the Facebook group led to cheating. Students had not been using the Facebook to cheat. Instead, guess what? They had been using it as a collaborative problem-solving tool. The case was dismissed, and Chris was brought back into college. <laughs> Think what would have happened if that had not been overruled. Uh, but it's interesting to see that these kids are inventing their own tool sets to meet with some of these problems. Let me take a couple more examples. Consider kind of the open source 
uh, movement as kind of a participatory learning platform. It's very interesting if you look at what is some of the kind of underlying social properties of an open source movement. In that movement, we write code to be read. You have to make code to be read because otherwise people can't read it, can't comment on it, can't modify it, and so on and so forth. And in fact, you become a better member of that community through basically making useful additions. And in this community, social capital matters, and so on. Now think about it a moment in terms of the changes. I don't know about a lot of you folks, but when I grew up, and I actually did study computer sciences, not 12, but after, uh, at the University of Michigan, um, basically, I became a hero if I could write code to solve a really hard problem that nobody could read because it was so obscure. <laughs> the macho behavior back then was be so clever that nobody could figure out what the hell you had done. <laughs> uh, guess what? I would have been tomb thrown out of any of the kind of open source movements. Uh, that ain't legitimate social behavior because other people can't read and learn from my activity, my code, and can't effectively modify and improve it. And so we found already a very interesting social innovation to escalate learning and knowledge creation um, in, on the fly in terms of social movements. Um, you had a form of peer critique as well, but if the code couldn't be read, you couldn't get kind of useful critique. And perhaps my last almost example um, has to do with the uh, pro-amateur movement um, in terms of, in my particular case, astronomy. And why I bring this up is the uh, idea I first got from, from Mimi. Uh, the word uh, amateur comes from amateur, meaning to love. Um, and the catch in this astronomy community is that, in fact, an interesting relationship has emerged between professional astronomers, astronomers and the kind of amateur ones. Because all of a sudden, the professionals found a reason to interact with the amateurs because the amateurs were developing kind of very interesting watching or looking practices. And today, to be a hotshot professional astronomer, you traffic in partial differential equations to the galore. Okay? You don't actually know much about looking through a telescope. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> um, but these amateurs know a hell of a lot about how to actually see things through a telescope. There are, there are honest to God practices for how do you see something through a telescope. This amateur community masters that. And because basically it's a 724 because there are amateurs all over the world, some of the most important discoveries, even in fundamental physics, having to do with the standard, the verification of the standard model, um, comes from the amateurs. Uh, being able to, in fact, prove when a certain supernova, um, 1987A, um, actually the photons hit the Earth uh, because they were monitoring in, uh, in New Zealand when this happened uh, and had taken photographs just before and just after, just after these neutrinos had been detected elsewhere in the world. And that was the missing link in the proof of the standard model of physics. After that happened, the game changed. The professionals, suddenly became very interested in mentoring the amateurs. A whole new way of doing science started to emerge. And finally, a last example of scalability, <laughs> an example under development that we may hear just maybe a little bit about later today or tomorrow, um, comes from Mimi, uh, uh, the whole notion of how, given that kind of mentoring is still so important, maybe it will always be so important, how might you actually get scalability in terms of one-on-one -on -one virtual mentoring? Uh, and she's asked a very provocative question. How do you build really sophisticated matching algorithms? She likes to call it eHarmony applied to tutoring. That actually knows how to take the particular idiosyncrasies of this student, this kid, and figure out who is the perfect tutor someplace in the world, a virtual tutor, to work with this kid. And you can see this being developed in things like actually math, um, where I first saw it happening in chess. Uh, I think I got that from Connie, actually, Julia. Um, and then StarCraft. Um, 
But here's an example of saying maybe we have the simplest way to get true scalability of one of the most profound kinds of learning you can imagine that is really skilled mentorship where there's a perfect match between the mentor and the student. So let's step back. What's the bigger picture? Um, I think the catch is that basically entrepreneurial learners are basically fundamentally makers and tinkerers. And we tend to underplay just how important this is. Um, yes, you might say critical thinking is important, um, but just the make move me and the tinkerers, guess what? They also understand critical thinking, but if you are a maker or you are a tinkerer, guess what? There's a notion of grounded truth. When I build a piece of software, yes, I'm doing it on my own sometimes. Um, yes, I'm cutting, making shortcuts. But the fact is, does this sucker work or not? There's this sense of I'm building something, does it work? Um, that also works in poetry. Does this poem hunt or not? Uh, and so there's a sense of saying it's not just critical thinking that matters, although it's important, but if critical thinking leads to making something, then the question is, what's the response structure of the thing you've just made? So we're kind of finding ways to close that loop as well. And I like to think of it as where knowledge and practice meet. So let's step back a moment. And let's look at what you might call a blended epistemology, coming again very much from Montessori. And that is to say, how do we begin to look at ways to combine homo sapiens, man as knower, uh, with homo faber, man as maker? And the curious thing is, um, we've always thought about homo faber as man as maker, maker of things, maker of content. Um, but the game has just changed. Now, today, in the networked age, with the tools we have at our disposal, we can now not only make things, but we can make contexts. It used to be that basically contexts were stable and recognize the fact that meaning often emerges as much from context as content. Um, and we can start to create contexts then we have a whole new dimension for creating meaning. We have a whole new way to create meaning, and we have a new type of interplay. And in fact, uh, to take a very concrete example of this somewhat obscure metaphysical notion of moving to homo faber to making context as well as content, of course, in simple terminology, what I've just said is this is the essence of remix. What is remix doing? it often is changing the context of a piece of content. Um, maybe one of the simplest examples um, is, and this is a beautiful exercise that I first actually did at, at USC, um, um, is a wonderful exercise for students to think about, is take uh, a movie um, or a movie trailer, if you want to be legal. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and change the music. And guess what? If you change the music, which is the context, to the content, the film, you not only change the meaning of that film, you actually change what you see. Let me give you a precise example. Um, I'll just suggest you do this. I'm going to tell you to do this. But take Jurassic Park. <laughs> uh, you all remember that famous scene of the uh, dinosaur chomping that guy? Uh, it's one of the most memorable images of that whole movie. Uh, it's never left my mind, um, um, my mind, my memory, whatever, uh, since I saw that. Um, well, guess what? That never happened. Do a still frame very carefully through that, and the critical moment, basically the image vaporizes, and the sound continues. The sound plays with your imagination and lets your imagination construct and fill in the image in a way that you will never forget. Okay? Uh, there's a beautiful example of context and content coming together uh, and it was much more dramatic than actually showing the final act itself. Um, and yet, I swore I saw it. And I really had to go over many times, single frame, 
because I was so convinced I had seen it, and it just changed it on me or something. Uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting issue of um, how do you actually kind of think about this rich interplay. Um, and I think what it really gets at, uh, and those of us in other parts of the, of the, of the academy worry a little bit more about this, is in this kind of very fluid world of uh, where we can now change contexts, this may be an example where critical thinking is now more important than ever. Because you have to ask yourself when you see something, maybe the thing you saw is right, but maybe the context itself has been modified. Um, so how many of you remember the famous pulling of the statue down in the square in Baghdad, the beginning of the Iraq war? Um, well, guess what? That context had been carefully cropped to get you to believe that those were Iraqis pulling that down. They weren't. They were American soldiers. Uh, and that had been clipped. Or you remember uh, Howard Dean and the scream that caused him to basically lose the election? Well, if you went back to the originals, one of the beauties of actually being at, uh, at, at USC where they have a film school and a communication school, you can find the original shots. Uh, guess what? He was actually talking to a room three times as long as this. He couldn't see the back, and he was talking to somebody at the back, and he was actually screaming at the person, at the group at the back. Um, but the press had magically cut that out to make it seem like he was going hysterical. Uh, they changed the frame, they changed the context, which completely changed the meaning of that. So one of the kinds of new types of critical thinking that we have to make sure our students do is yes, remix is important, but yes, you also begin to realize how through remix you change meaning. Uh, and now how do you decide to deconvolve how much of the context has been modified in order to communicate or miscommunicate that point? Um, blah, blah, blah. So. Um, so they say, we used to focus on content. Uh, but you know, it's also considered blogging. You know, blogging is in fact, in a very interesting way, constructing a context as much as content. I'm very struck by Andy Sullivan. Um, and he wrote a beautiful article on why I blog in Atlantic Monthly. Um, let me just kind of read a little bit of it. From his point of view, uh, blogging is something that engages what I would call joint context creation. Let me explain. The blogger, as he said, the blogger is more than any writer of the past, a node among other nodes, connected but unfinished, without the links and the comments and the trackbacks that make the blogosphere at its best a conversation rather than a production. Jazz. David, listen. <laughs> Jazz and blogging are intimate, improvisational, and individual, but also inherently, are also inherently collective. And the audience talks over both. This sense of a new kind of conversation that happens in this joint context construction of an ongoing conversation is a whole new mode of context construction, meaning creation. And one last example of this, a beautiful new book by David Weinberg, Too Big to Know. Think about that a moment. We used to know how to know, going back to some of the slides on epistemology. We got our answers from books or experts. We nailed down the facts and moved on. We, after all, had canons. No comment, David. But in the internet age, knowledge has moved on to networks. There's more knowledge than ever, but it's different. Topics have no boundaries, and nobody, guess what, agrees on anything. <laughs> we, as learners, need new strategies and new tools for this world. And a lot of us in this room are here to create those. An interesting notion. If you come from our movements in the, uh, 10 years ago in terms of the communities of practice, some of Jean Lave's beautiful work as well, um, you might say we learned in order to belong. We learned in order to be able to join a community of practice. We created our identity through learning to join. And that, we believe, was a fundamental force of learning through and for identity construction. Some of us want to argue today that this has slightly changed. Doug Thomas and myself 
would like to propose, maybe now we belong to learn instead of learning to belong. But it's a different sense of belong. The initial sense of Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger, Paul Duguid and myself and others, um, that sense of belonging was to create an identity. Perhaps now we belong to learn, that sense of belonging is a sense of personal agency. We now belong to learn in order to make things actually happen. So I want to kind of just allude to these notions of collectives as a whole new form that we all use in this room as a major source of learning. Collectives are made up of folks who share an individual's personal interest, gardening, astronomy, see them all in Facebook groups, et cetera, et cetera. But curiously, unlike communities of practice, they make no demands on ex-users, no tests, no lectures, yet learning happens all the time. Collectives are focused on enabling individual agency. They are a site for both play and imagination where the personal can mesh with the collective, transforming and enriching both. So when I go to a collective, I learn something, but I'm expected to contribute something, maybe just through the question that I ask. They have almost unlimited scale via social networks, and at their core rest notions of peer and master mentoring. We have already invented amazing techniques at scale, um, if you kind of understand this. Sounds cool. On the other hand, in this world of constant change, all these techniques we're talking about, including some aspects of the collectives and the way that the personal and the collective interact, we still might be just pouring, you might call it um, new wine in old bottles. In a constantly changing world, sometimes we must be prepared to craft new bottles as well. It's all too easy to try to use old frames to understand the world today. But if, if our initial thesis is right, we have to find new ways to grind, regrind our lenses. So a simple belief, in a world of constant change, entrepreneurial learners must also be willing to regrind their conceptual lenses. How do you rebuild a conceptual lens? Our argument is play. Play is the essential thing for actually being able to rebuild your lens. Um, that brings us to a third form of epistemology. We talked about homo sapiens, homo ludens. Now I want to kind of end with looking at this notion of homo, I talked about homo sapien and homo faber. Now I want to talk about homo ludens from uh, uh, Johann Huizinghi. Um, the highly nuanced concept of play, and I want to argue that our job in part is to go back and reflect on the more nuanced aspects of play. Now a key aspect of play um, is not that subtle, it's kind of a permission to fail, fail, fail again and get it right. Mimi, think of how you learned how to surf. Uh, um, think of extreme sports. Failure is a critical part of that learning. But also think about the play of imagination in writing poetry. How do you kind of tinker with a phrase, trying one phrase after another phrase after another phrase to get that phrase just right? And perhaps most importantly, you think about an epiphany. How do you play with something until something just falls in place? That's to say, learning as riddles, leading to a reframing or re-registering of the world is basically what riddles and epiphanies are about. I mention that because if we can create one epiphany for one child, that epiphany lasts for life for that kid. Um, brilliant teachers are brilliant in being able to create epiphanies for kids. Um, how do we think about that? And how do we use play as a way to amplify the chance for that to happen? So first, let's look at a very simple example of reframing um, and think of the kind of the tension in your own mind. This is a very simple example. And then suddenly how it clicks into place either by yourself or when somebody shouts out the answer. And how you have to play with this idea a little bit in order to figure out how to gel the facts in a new way to suddenly make instant sense of everything that was just said. So this is the simplest example. A black dog 
is sleeping in the middle of a black road that has no street lights, and by the way, there's no moon. A car coming down the road with its lights off magically steers around the dog. How did the driver know the dog was there? It's daytime. I said, this is a very simple riddle. <laughs> but there's tension, and then suddenly you play with it. You play with the context, by the way, and think, aha, uh, this is trivial. If it's daytime, everything falls into place. That is a very simple example. Now take yourself into the CIA and think about what the riddles are there and how they have to tinker with the context in order to make sense. We may come back to that. Um, but let's look at these three different epistemologies, knowing, making, playing, and think about how they may be blended together, first of all, in a very simple way, in terms of tinkering. I mean, tinkering brings knowing, making, and playing all together. Um, and in fact, tinkering is, is catalytic to many kids as a way to kind of understand the moves that are possible. Now, the reason I bring up tinkering in particular is in a world of constant change, if you don't feel comfortable tinker, tinkering, you're going to feel an amazing state of anxiety. Because needless to say, as you saw us here a moment ago, um, things don't always work. <laughs> uh, and if you feel you have to run and get a manual and figure out how to read exactly what you should be doing and you've made a mistake somewhere, uh, then you can't help but be a little bit pissed off. <laughs> uh, if, on the other hand, uh, you feel completely at home just saying, well, let me kind of play around with the situation a little bit and see if we can kind of make it work. And then you make it work, not only have you learned something new, but you feel like you are now in control of things. And so this sense of play in a world of constant change through the lens of tinkering becomes very powerful. But tinkering can be more than just that. It really is a case that if you get skilled at tinkering, you begin to get a gut feeling for how systems work. You get a sense of what can be pushed around. You get a sense of what are the pushbacks all about. You start to develop an, almost an intimate familiarity with the system itself, the material at hand. It is a form of being embodied. You're embodied, it kind of is a form of embodied immersion, and you start to develop an instinct. And of course, it's deeply situated. So there's a kind of a deep structure type of tinkering that I think we're now looking at that leads to this reframing that is completely aligned with this sense of the epiphany stuff. Um, and how do you kind of play with really radically changing the context which starts to build new lenses that you can use. Um, so I want to suggest that if you look at the world through most schooling systems today, if you look at the weighting of influence, homo sapien is way up here, homo farber sometimes sneaks in at the edge, and homo lutens called play usually gets wiped off the screen. Um, but if you look at the shifts that every one of us in this room kind of already lives daily, is we've moved from a world of knowing just what, but perhaps even more important, knowing of where. Where do you find what you need? How do you tinker with the network to find what you need if you don't know exactly where it is? And thinking has moved, as I said, from making his move from just making things to things in context. And playing now has as much to do with sense making. How do I play with the situation to make sense out of it? That's why I talked about this kind of deep structure tinkering. So I want to suggest that the world we're actually moving into and the tools that we want to build, the institutions we want to create, the different types of connections we want to make, and the different types of institutions that already make up our context and maybe make some new institutions, really says, how do we get a more balanced structure between knowing, making, and playing? homo sapien, homo faber, homo ludens. Um, and think about this in terms of riddling and world building. How do you actually start to kind of build new worlds um, with the network tools that we actually have, which is the deepest kind of tinkering? And I said that in some deep way, in terms of the crisis of imagination or thinking about imagination, you know, the catch, and this comes back to working intelligence as well, um, how do you take something that's really strange 
and construct a world so that this strange event suddenly makes all the sense in the world. Guess what? That is what Harry Potter's books are about. Taking the wand, the magic wand, that seems in some sense so strange, operates in a world of no electricity. How can that be? Um, and now a world gets constructed for you through the novel, through the set of novels, where this strange idea seems so obvious you never thought it could be strange. And I want to suggest that we have to go back and think much more about the tools today for building worlds. It's going to completely change the notion of film, change the world of games. It's going to change a lot of things about how do we think about world building such that I can take a strange event and make it seem so natural. And in fact, some of the deepest challenges we have in intelligence is how do you take some strange event and let me construct a set of scenarios, a set of personal motivations, etc., that takes that strange event and say, well, how else could it be? Well, we can do that. We may finally begin to understand parts of the world that seem so mysterious to us today. Um, and this suggests that the real game that we have today in this networked age is new notions of networks of imagination. How do we amplify our ability through kind of emergent collective action? And we've seen many examples of collective action to create a sense of shared imagination. And the reason I personally bring this up it's because I was one of the, the, the original people that argued back in 19, a long time ago, um, that communities of practice had to have a sense of co-presence. Um, if they were going to be distributed, we tended to call them networks of practice. But possibly, just possibly, and you see it developing in some of the game worlds as well, and some of these imagined worlds that you start to construct, I can construct jointly with people around the world a shared imagination that makes me feel totally co-present in the mental space with the others. Um, there's something very powerful at stake here that we're only beginning to unpack now. Um, so let me just kind of say, repeating myself, that in a world of constant change, entrepreneurial learners must be willing to regrind our conceptual lenses with which we make sense and play essential, but the key part of play is play is a space of safety and permission. What kinds of permission do we give our students today? What kinds of permission are required for the tools we're talking about to really have their power? And what types of institutional innovations do we need to think about that grant those types of permissions in order to be playful in this deep epistemological sense? Um, I was going to end, but there is a brief, very brief, epilogue. <laughs> and Mimi, <laughs> I know what you're thinking, JP, what are you doing? <laughs> this is a talk, not a book. <laughs> but uh, two slides on uh, epilogue. I like to think about back to the future, again, in terms of Montessori, but maybe even predating Montessori. Some of the greatest learning environments were actually the one room schoolhouse. Why were they so effective? It's because the teacher wasn't transferring knowledge, but the teacher was acting as a coach, a coordinator, a mentor, that getting older kids to spend some time helping younger kids. So the kids, older kids were teaching the younger kids, and then the younger kids would turn around and also teach the younger, younger kids. It was an amazing social dynamic in that classroom. And the teacher was responsible for orchestrating that amazing ability to learn and to teach simultaneously by each student in that class. Now, I want to leave us with one simple challenge. If you kind of understand the social and psychodynamics of how that classroom worked and the skills that that teacher brought to the surface. By the way, that teacher was not a master of the material, but a master of the way the kids thought, the fears they had, how to read them, couple into their interest, and so on and so forth. But now, let us ask, is it possible we're getting a position to take the one-room schoolhouse and make it the global one-room schoolhouse through these networks of imagination and new forms of mentorship? Thank you.
was just a warm up. <laughs> Are you ready to do your real talk now? <laughs> <laughs> that would be nice. Um, well, great. Thank you. So let me, I don't have a, a time piece. Does anyone know exactly? We have 15 minutes, 20 minutes for Q&A. So there are mics here in the, the, I guess, just there. Please, if you are going to ask a question, please come to the mic so that those of our listening audience at home can participate. Um, are you prepared for the Q&A ensemble? Well, please be polite. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Donald, hi. That was a great talk. I mean, wonderful. Uh, I'm Donald Brinkman. I'm from Microsoft Research. Uh, you gave us some wonderful vehicles uh, to, to kind of take us into new places to think. And, and I would like to uh, commandeer one of those vehicles and see if I can drive it off a cliff. And uh, so, so I'm... I, the universe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk about uh, guilds and, you know, World of Warcraft and communities around that and, and yep. the production. Right. Um, and the, uh, these communities, uh, they, they do work wonderfully together to solve these complex problems. But they also, uh, they're very specialized and there's a, uh, um, a uh, you know, differentiation in the levels of labor and the levels of, of knowledge that go with that. Uh, and similarly with the dashboards, um, you mentioned that people custom make those dashboards, but I would argue that the majority of them are actually downloading and maybe, you know, tailoring them a little bit. These are what we'd call script kitties, uh, which make up a lot of that. And in traditional education system, I think that uh, we use standardized tests to try to kind of bring everyone in line. but in, in you know, in, in unorganized gaming environments, we don't do that. So we allow people to specialize. And this makes me think back to some of the, the original intentions of educational institutions to prepare the majority of people for unskilled labor, maybe some craftsmen, and, and allow only a select few to, to really excel. And so my question is, is that the future that you see? Or, I mean, are we trying to, to, to boil the ocean and bring everyone to this level of being visionary creators and, and Bezos, or are we, looking for a system that allows people to percolate to their level and stop putting demands that everyone become uh, a liberal, technical, uh, conceptual humanist. So, so uh, <laughs> by the way, do you have a point of view? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's curious because I started getting a lot of my ideas actually on the, um, the factory floors of Toyota. Uh, and I was called in by General Motors to explain Toyota to General Motors. Uh, I, by the way, failed. <laughs> uh, this was some time ago. Um, and you know, what I saw developing on the factory floors of Toyota uh, was amazing. I, f I felt like I'd just gone into a choreographed like ballet. Um, and when anything went wrong, um, you know, the cord was pulled and that entire factory became instantaneously problem solving um, and was designed so that basically talent was being created and being augmented every moment of the day. And so I think that as we move into the 21st century, we have to completely rethink the workscape as a learning scape. We have to find ways that each of us get more talented uh, by working. Um, and so, you know, in the schooling example you gave, and in every corporation I've ever been in, um, basically managers assess me, and they build the monitors uh, to do that. Uh, what we're suggesting is how do you flip that thing upside down and say, no, no, let us, the employees, build the tools to measure our performance. Um, and then as a group, we will agree on what those tools will be, and so on and so forth. So we're really trying to, to amplify the emergent rather than figure out a lockstep into the top. Um, now, it helps to have a vision on the top, um, but I'm getting kind of tired of vision. <laughs> um, but it still probably helps to create some alignment. So I think everyone in this room is we're actually looking for tools to amplify the emergent, bring some kind of alignment amongst that emergent, um, bring the kinds of negotiations that have to happen in any group. Uh, and there's a whole new style of working. And if you look at even how the, the, some of the newest ideas, as Mimi and the, through Scott know, um, now looking at making movies, 
where they don't start with a script. All the players come together uh, and actually start to construct the movie in situ. Um, There's a whole new theory of how to make movies, uh, driven by Alex McDowell, uh, the guy that did uh, Minority Report and a bunch of more recent movies than that. And so I think we're really finding that we're going to kind of shake up our institutional structures. And I would call the ways we made movies in the old an, an institutional form. Uh, and so I think that, that, yes, we were trained and we were assessed in the old days in order to fit, not in low-skill work necessarily, but to fit um, in any kind of bureaucratic structure, be it a factory or be it you know, a big box. Uh, and in today's 21st century, it ain't going to work. Uh, you know, and I spend a tremendous amount of my life, as a couple of you know, in, in, in Asia. Uh, and this sense of entrepreneurial learner, I picked up in Asia. Uh, you think they do the lockstep we're talking about? I'll tell you, those kids are so hungry for inventing things themselves that they are constantly, you know, doing amazing things. And if you go into the factories over there, you'd be surprised now what you see going on there. I could talk forever on that topic, but we'll let other people. <laughs> yeah. My question is on those. Oh, my name is Jonathan Dugan. My question is on those institutional structures, and I was hoping you could talk about time scales. So the networked systems you're talking about move on incredibly fast time scales because of all the different interactions. But if you look at schools at the local level or universities or workplaces, um, they seem to be throttled at, at moving at very much slower time scales. And so do you think that it's going to become one where we change those structures or the structures themselves change to, to meet the speed at which progress is happening? I mean, I tell you my dream, um, but it actually comes from the, from the work I do with some of my colleagues here at, uh, at uh, Center for the Edge. Um, you know, what's happened, how, got, how DML got started in the first place is kind of a shift to focus from the core to the edge and realize that if you work with the edge, um, you can get a lot more action for the same amount of effort and actually find the ways to deploy brand new tools and ideas and so on. So connected learning to some extent is how do you do things on the edge, look at all the things happening in your community as parts of edge resources, connect those together, and how do you actually build a learning environment outside school where kids that take advantage of it uh, actually start to become a productive force to suggest that the core actually start modifying itself. So when, you, when teachers suddenly see kids come alive in their class because of the experiences they're doing outside, uh, then lo and behold, they start asking questions and so on and so forth. So I think there's some interesting social dynamics that can be brought to play here. Um, my guess is in the, uh, you know, in the corporate world that I spend at least half my time thinking about, um, we're now beginning to say that you know, in the old days, uh, we had places on the edge like Xerox Park, and we would invent the future and try to push it into the core, and the core developed brilliant immune systems to kill us. <laughs> um, that technique turned out not to be too effective. Um, a lot of companies got started, but Xerox didn't necessarily change. Uh, the, uh, the real catch now is can we invert that whole process by saying is trying to take these great things happening on the edge, instead of pushing them into the core, can we flip and say can the edge pull things from the core to the edge? because now we have tools so powerful on the edge that we can build our businesses, we can build our schooling systems um, that are highly specialized in ways you never could before. So basically from the corporate world, the tools of social networks let us have infinite reach outside, but also have much deeper reach into the core through the social networks you build from the edge to the core. So I think we're finding fundamentally new ways to bring about change um, and I think a lot of what you're going to see here at DML around the connected learning is really now looking much more carefully at how you build webs of connections outside uh, that actually become so powerful that it actually starts to change people in the core. Not through terror, not through push, but through seduction and pull. Hi, I'm Robert Clegg, co-founder of Tabula Digita. We're one of the first venture capital-based startups back in 2002. So my question to you is, it turns out that the funding mechanisms for creating high-quality 
capstone project, project-based learning, linked to core standards here for multiplayer environment networks with great content so that kids learn and explore and play is not a scalable funding model. How do you see funding startups in this really, and entrepreneurs in this really difficult funding environment, and how do you see this playing out over time when only limited sources of capital really have the basis to create compelling uh, products in the space? You know, as you know, and as you know that I know, there's no easy solution to that problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, I would look a little bit to places like India and China. Um, because what you now find is the startups over there are enrolling parents left, right, and sideways to take the added advantages of some of the techniques you're talking about to give their kids an extra chance. Um, and so, for example, you find a massive tutoring business over there. Interesting question, how much of that can be automated today? Uh, and so I think you're going to find that there are ways to attract parents and maybe even kids themselves uh, to wanting to put up some of their own money um, to do some of this stuff. Now, you know, the other side of the coin is um, there is going to become, as part of this Cambrian moment, a place where if we want to, for example, return manufacturing seriously to this country, um, you know, the argument we're making is a key part of that is how do you excel in, in tinkering? And I think you're going to suddenly find some startups that are going to be aimed toward creating a skill base that actually facilitates that. Uh, and I think we may find new ways to work with community colleges and new funding methods in there. So I, I mean, I, I think that this, this can be a moment we're throwing a lot of things up in the air and they're going to come down differently. Now, you know, in the venture game, um, we don't expect very many of our bets to work. Uh, sorry to say. <laughs> uh, but I think that uh, we've got to change the conversation. Um, and, you know, there are some people that put serious money into this. Um, and there are some brilliant new ideas coming out. I think the New York Times this week uh, had a whole article on the prizes. Uh, read that article and there are some institutional innovations coming along there because they think there's a market failure. And what you're talking about is potentially a market failure, uh, a structural hole. Uh, there may be some new clever ways to how to start to find new ways to, to, to fund and fill those structural holes. Five minutes, so please be oh, brief okay. in your question and your okay. response. I will. I will. <laughs> <laughs> Should that be longer? Oh, no, I can't promise to be brief Just in my class, but I'll try. We have yeah. four people, yeah. and I'd like okay. everybody to get a okay. chance. So. Um, yeah, so first, thank you for so beautifully laying out the vision that I know you know we share about the potential of these new networks to really transform learning and expand the schoolhouse um, to be much more than um, I think what we've seen in recent history. I, sort of linking back to some of Diana's opening comments, I was um, thinking or wondering if you could speak to some of the barriers and risks that we're facing in doing this because at the same time that I totally recognize the potential of these new networks for this expansive model of learning and for um, promoting tinkering and play and that spirit of experimentation, I'm also seeing these very uh, threatening trends towards an arms race of achievement and getting into traditional avenues of education and getting certain kinds of jobs in a contracting economy and the fact that the kids who are aspiring towards these trajectories are leading incredibly overscheduled, hyper-achievement oriented lives that are the antithesis of the kind of play and experimentation that you're talking about at the same time that new technologies are actually not about expanding the doors of the classroom but about colonizing every moment of kids' lives with the logic of precisely the forms of learning that we might want to keep at bay. And so I see these countervailing trends and, um, you know, I think we have a lot of reason to be hopeful, but I also was wondering if that you could signal for us some of the things we should be wary of or concerned about too. Yes. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I was very brave. <laughs> 
I, the, uh, I, I don't. I don't know. I'm not at all coming from New York City. At all familiar with what you're talking about. Kids being overscheduled. <laughs> you know, I mean, what's ironic about this is I keep bugging Mimi. Please write your next book. Please write your next book. And your connected thing that you're going to are you going to release that here? Okay. Well, um, you have half those answers there. Um, wh where I get, I think you do at least. Um, the um, the two issues I think that are going to be uh, f forcing functions on the horizon. One, believe it or not, is Asia is finally waking up to the fact that their methods of education, which we are now systematically trying to copy, are so 20th century that they're going to overthrow them. And I'll tell you, countries like Singapore, parts of Singapore and Korea, I just came from, um, you know, are kind of laughing at America, saying like, you know, what are you guys, are you crazy? I mean, we, we excel on all those testings, and we know we're not successfully preparing people for the 21st century. We're now got to completely revamp our game. But the bigger problem you have is this notion of permission to fail, uh, which is why I, I brought up play, and this kind of perverse notion of safety. Uh, because, in fact, the, the most unsafe things you can do is not let your kids actually start to understand how to interact with the world world. Um, and so, you know, I think we have a huge problem there. Uh, and I think it's part of media's problem of creating a fear-based culture. Uh, and that fear-based culture has very little backing to it. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Biho from Malaysia. Uh, I, I think I'm one of the examples that you mentioned, like Asian that can create things, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> So my question is, um, how, the, how the assessment or evaluation uh, could be blended in the proposed blended epistemology? Um, how? Because um, in Asian, we want to see proof. Right. Mm. Well, n not just Asia, by the way. I mean, uh, 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 everybody I run into, especially in Washington, wants proof. Because um, proof is in the eye of the beholder, uh, by the way. Um, you know, I keep thinking, going back to the question from the, uh, from the entrepreneur here, also being a venture capitalist um, to some extent, uh, or more of an angel, I mean, that's a technical term, <laughs> um, the, um, is uh, the proof of the pudding is show me your portfolio. You know, if I hire an artist, I want to see the portfolio. If I hire a writer, I want to see the writing. If I hire a coder, I want to see the code. Um, and so, you know, and then I want to talk. I want to talk through that. And so, um, you know, as, as Diana said, I, you know, I ran Xerox Park. Uh, well, actually, I hired a lot of people at Xerox Park for, for now 35 years there. Um, I never once have ever looked at a transcript of a student. Um, you know, and the, uh, to me, for what I was looking for, the transcripts are meaningless. Um, and the, the game is, let's have a conversation around something you've done. And then I will get a sense for what are your sensibilities, what are the nuances that you bring to the table, and so on and so forth. And David, I don't know if you knew this, but I, I did also graduate admission for a little while. <laughs> I ran into too much trouble at UC Irvine in the computer science department. Um, I instituted a policy when I was allowed to. I mean, I, I, it took me out of that job. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> Where, you know, if, if, you graduate, if an undergraduate applies to you that gets an A++ average, you kind of, unless you want to go to law or to court, you, you admit them, you know. Um, but if you get a B-plus student, I look for the highest variance. So if I get a B-plus student that consists of all A-pluses and a few Fs, I say, that kid has research potential. Okay? Because that kid is willing to say, screw off. <laughs> All right. And I like we, that. Next, we have to move to the next question so that we can make sure everybody gets a chance. Hi, I'm Yvette Wan from Michigan State University. Um, I'm a PhD student and I was really interested in your tacit um, learning, uh, learning transfer argument, especially because I feel a lot of the research that we do is in academic silos and as a young scholar I am encouraged to stay within my own field. However, going to conferences such as this one, um, HCI and communication, I feel like my work speaks to a broader audience. Um, could you give any advice to a young scholar as in terms of how to disseminate our knowledge to different communities? You, you know, I mean, first of all, coming to conferences like this um, is, is critical. Uh, and 
getting your work out, speaking about your work, et cetera, et cetera, is critical. Uh, I don't know how much you blog about your work, um, but you, know, you don't get a lot of cred inside the academy for blogging, but you got a lot of visibility outside, you build connections. Um, and don't just look at the academy looking at itself. I mean, if you actually start to engage folks outside, um, you know, we're looking more and more for how do you have a dialogue between the outside the university and inside. Um, and that dynamic is slowly happening. But um, my best advice is don't give up. All right, and the last question. Hi, I'm Sarah Field from New Tech Network. Um, and I'm actually curious, there have been a couple of articles lately, one in the New York Times and one in the New Yorker, and I'm sure others um, in other places, kind of pushing back on the notion of collaboration as the answer to all of our problems or to many of the, the problems that we're facing and kind of talking about how we might be losing something um, in not also focusing on the power of individual work and individual reflection um, and kind of the learning that happens on your own as, as a human being. So I'm curious about, a um, huge fan of collaboration and crowdsourcing, but also wondering if you have a perspective on whether we're over collaborating in certain areas and whether there's anything that's lost in that process. Yeah. Um, I don't think we know how to do collaboration very well. And you know, I would call on us to look much more carefully at what happens in architectural studios and how you have much more productive forms of critiquing, uh, not criticism, uh, how the mentors actually play out in these studios. And I think that um, we confuse collaboration with crowdsourcing and a few things like that um, and don't understand productive friction and how great ideas come from productive friction, not just brainstorming. Uh, so there's a whole long story here, but uh, Diane's going to kill me if I go into it. Thank you. There is a long story there, and you can find many and most of J JSB's thoughts on a whole array of topics. I'm not sure if nanotechnology is, on, is there, but on his website. So if you would like to read more of his work, follow more of his thoughts, you can find him on his blog. Right? Websites. Websites. Sorry. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>